And what I'm going to do tonight, guys, is the um, is I'm going to look at some kind of well-known uh, convolutional neural network architectures. So I'll, I'll go through about five different architectures that are, are pretty famous. Um, it's not them all by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it, th they are very, very important ones. So to understand how architectures have progressed, we'll take a quick tour of significant architectures and kind of when they happened. Um, these are all feed forward classification or local and usually and or, or localization um, type architectures. We're, start, we're going to start with the Linet, which is 1998, and then it's quite a quite a jump. It's 14 years before we go to the AlexNet at 2012. Then we have some some fairly quick progression there, 2014, 2014 again, and 2015. So these are some famous ones. It's not that nothing has come along since that or anything. There certainly has been um, a lot of work in architectures, but they're way too numerous to to mention here. So don't assume that these are the only architectures. You know, there's way too many to go through in this lecture. But um, though these ones, these five that are mentioned here, they're unlikely to be left out of any list. So that's why it's important maybe to go through them and just give you a flavour of the sort of things that people do architecturally with regard to um, to these um, networks. So we'll start with the LeeNet, which is uh, named after Jan LeCun. By the way, most of these networks, obviously, they're, they're, if you read the original paper, they're not called the name that we give them here. It's normally that when they become so famous afterwards that they're given these uh, kind of colloquial names. So the LeeNet goes back to 1998. I think I mentioned in the last lecture, Jan LeCun, who's um, you know a, a big name in terms of deep learning. He works with Facebook, I think, now. Um, and this, but didn't at the time, obviously, um, this was the first kind of successful use of a convolutional neural network. Um, it was used for looking at, you know, reading handwritten digits in uh, in postal codes. Um, and it was it was actually deployed, uh, deployed for real for uh, in a lot of postal services. Um, but it'd be a while before CNNs would be able to be used at, at the sort of scale that we see them at today. Um, and, and the sort of size. What I've done here just is, um, I've given a link to the paper in each case, but one of the other things that I've included is the number of citations that these, these papers received. And this is uh, good just to kind of give you an idea of uh, how important or how influential these papers were. Now, it's it's a bit difficult to say kind of where these stand in terms of the uh, papers, um, you know, the highest cited papers of all time. But but they're well up there. I mean, I, I certainly know that in um, I think there was a, there was a review done in 2012 of the highest ranked papers. And I think to get into the top 10 back then, you needed more than 40,000 citations. Um, the, those are papers worldwide. Uh, a lot of the papers you're going to see tonight have all come since that. And despite the fact that they're relatively new papers, have all had huge numbers of citations. Um, so this, you know, generally speaking, if if you get a paper that's had 20 citations, you're 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 more than happy with that. Um, and most papers don't maybe don't get any citations. I might only have two or three. Um, but you can see here that this one has had uh, 21,331. So it's been very very influential. The next one then is the, is the AlexNet, um, and this was, it came along in 2012, and this was a breakthrough for CNNs because um, it was the, the the first convolutional neural network to win the ImageNet challenge. But not only did it win the ImageNet challenge, it won it by a huge margin, and the ImageNet challenge has never been won since by any other um, by anything other than a convolutional neural network. So. This guy, Alex Krzyzewski, and he worked with a, with a lot of other people. One very, very famous name that's in here um, is uh, Jeffrey Hinton. And uh, this is Jeffrey's, Jeffrey's um, uh, you, you, uh, research group, and Alex Krzyzewski would have uh, worked with him. So probably a, a PhD student or maybe a postdoc under, under Jeffrey. Um, this was an extremely important uh, convolutional neural network, as I said, because it was the kind of the first time that this was done at scale. The previous case, we're looking at very, very small images, so 32 by 32 pixels, okay, and uh, generally kind of grayscale images, or they might be converted to grayscale. So, um, you know, you're you're not really talking about very large images. Whereas when we go here to AlexNet, we're now talking about images that are 224 by 224. So that's that's a significant jump, and obviously we're dealing with color images as well. Now this looks much more complex. Uh, well, it was a complex network, but it looks much more complex than it actually was here because of the fact that um, graphical uh, processing units at the time, or graphics processing units, were not 
large enough in terms of memory to store the entire network uh, on one um, GPU. That's partly because this was a si quite a sizable network and also partly because uh, of the fact that GPUs were just quite small at the time. So you can see here that what's happened is that they've had to split this up. You can see, well, maybe I'll use the, the, the highlighter here. You can see that they've had to split this up into two different sections over two GPUs in order to get this to work. Okay, so, so that's the reason for that. Um, just to give you an idea of the number of citations, um, 47,809 uh, citations. That's obviously when I, I, I wrote down the number when I was writing a set of notes. So you, probably if you check on Google Scholar now, you'll see that that, that citation number has probably gone up um, since uh, even in the past few weeks. Um, and that's because a huge amount of people uh, will obviously be, be citing it as they, as they, as they go. Okay. Um, so that was a, a hugely influential network. Um, we can see the um, we can see that this is this is something I've forgotten the details of this. You can see that this is two two seven two two uh, by two two seven, whereas I said a minute ago that it was two two four by two two four. Now I've forgotten just off the top of my head what the difference is that um, uh, which which was used. But as far as I know, it was it was two two seven. There was some reason why it was shown in the picture as different, and I. I knew it at the time I wrote the notes and I've forgotten what it is now. So apologies for that. If I remember it, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in. Um, so 227 by 227 by 3 as an input. And what they then have is each of these different layers along the way. Um, so they have, um, they have these 11 by 11 filters. And what happens is that they use these as a, at a stride of 4. And so that's why this got got dropped from 227 down to 55 uh, in each of these cases. They then have this 3 by 3 filter at a stride of 2. And that brought it down to 27. And from there they use the 27s for a while. But then they do another um, uh, max pooling operation here at a stride of 2. Again, and that brings it down. That brought it from 27 down to, to 13. Uh, they stay at that until they eventually do um, a max pooling down to 6x6. Six six. Uh, so another 3x3 uh, three three with a stride of 2. Um, so you can see that they're kind of using on even, they're using odd numbers there. And uh, that allows them to use a 3x3 three three and a stride of 2. But we'll see that a lot of the filters that come along since um, tend to use even numbers. And uh, usually use a max pooling off a 2x2 two two with a stride of 2 or something like that. Um, what I'm going to do is maybe just get, uh, we'll do a few calculations here just so that we kind of get, understand what happens at each of these layers. So I've, I've made a note for myself to to uh, maybe um, determine the how many parameters would be used at this layer and how many, um, you know, what would be the size in terms of memory of the activation. So this layer, first of all, this 13 by 13 by 384. It's convolutional layer three, as it's been named in 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 the uh, in this particular paper, and it's using three by three. Sorry, guys, I've lost my. Uh... Lost my thing off the screen. Get it back up there. Okay, so. It's uh, they're using three by three filters, a uh, stride of one and a pad of one. OK, so how do we figure out exactly how uh, how many parameters this layer uses? Well, it uses three by three filters, firstly. So three by three filters. And if you remember from from last week, uh, we discussed the fact that the three by three filters have to go through the full depth of the layer previous to it. So we need to look at the layer previous to it and we can see that the layer previous had 256 of a depth. So that's two, 256. And we said uh, that normally what we've done and sometimes when you see the calculations for this, they, they, they leave out the bias simply because it's so small, but we'll include it here just for, for completeness. So we normally put in a bias at that point. And then what we notice is that this layer has 384 of these type of filters. So therefore, we would multiply that by 384 there in order to find out the total number of parameters that would be required for this particular layer. So uh, to get that, I think uh, I did some of this calculation earlier. Um, everything in here, you can check my numbers here, 32305. And we're going to multiply that by 384. 
and that comes out at um, 885120. Okay, so that's the number of parameters that would be used at this layer. Let's have a think about how many activations or what, what memory we would require for the activations at this layer. Um, so in terms of the, the layer here, what we have is we have a 13 by 13 by 384. So that's going to be the size of the overall you know, uh, volume of the activations. So that's 13 by 13 by 384. Okay, and uh, I've done that calculation there and it comes out as 64896. So what is that? What's the unit for this? Because obviously this is in parameters. It's in parameters. What is the unit for this? So it really depends. It's going to be in bytes, but it really depends on um, how many uh, bits you have per activation. So if you have only eight bits per activation, which would be quite small if you're not using, you know, uh, you, that would assume that you're only using integers, um, then this would be in bytes. But if you were using something like four four bytes per activation, so because you were using some maybe 32-bit float, then you'd multiply this by four in order to figure out the total number of bytes. Okay, so if you know, whenever you're looking at a situation like this, you need to see, well, how many of the activations am I going to have? And then um, what sort of uh, memory do I require for each activation? The other thing to keep in mind here is that that's how many you would need for an activation. But we saw when we were doing back propagation that you, you often had to retain those activations and then you needed quite a bit of memory to deal with each of the different gradients and so on that come along um, along the way. Um, whereas if you were just doing inference, this is all that you were, would require at this particular layer. So you might need twice this if you were dealing with, um, if you were doing your back propagation and so on with regard to the amount of memory. Um, one thing that we see generally is that we generally, as we go through the network at the early layers, we use um, fewer parameters, but we use more memory. And as we get later, we use more parameters, but less memory. Now that's not... That's not a hard and, uh, hard and fast rule, but certainly that seems to be mostly the case, particularly when we get up to these fully connected layers. So let's have a look at one of these fully connected layers and have a think about um, how, much, uh, how many parameters that we would require. So we're going to look at this particular one here, which is a fully connected layer of 4096 neurons. So that's simply just 4096 neurons. But as we can see, that has to be connected to every one of the neurons in the previous layer. So in effect, what we have is 4096 by 4096. So in this case, we're going to have, I didn't actually do this calculation, so I'll do it, do it now. So it's 4096 squared, and it comes out as a very big number, 1677216. Uh, so that's the number of parameters uh, that would be required. And you're talking about nearly nearly 17 million parameters. Okay, so that's that's got, that's going to be very, very large. So most of the parameters are up in these last few layers. So that's the number of parameters. How much memory is used? Well, actually, the, num the amount of memory that's used is just the 4096 because that's the size of the activations that come out of this because we've really reduced... Um, we've reduced down the dimensionality down now to 4096 from what was much higher dimensions in the in the earlier layers. So 496 and then is that is that bytes or is it uh, do we need four times that in order to determine the number of bytes again that depends on uh, on your network and um, what size of, of parameter numbers that you're putting out. And of course you can always take this and try and maybe quantize it later on to make a more efficient network in terms of that. Later on we'll, we'll do a, an overall comparison of a lot of these networks in terms of how many parameters they needed, how much memory they, they used. So the parameters tells you straight away about how many calculations are required in order to do uh, you know, a single inference through it and therefore also how long it's going to take to train it. Whereas the memory tells you about how much space it's going to take up, particularly um, important when it comes to something like inference, where you want to maybe put this on some form of an embedded system um, and try and have it uh, do, doing inference. In most cases, a lot of these networks might be too big for an embedded system and they might have to be done in the cloud. Okay, so that's uh, that's a, an idea of um, you know some of the, 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 the numbers related to AlexNet, but let's have a look at some of the other architectural details because oftentimes the devil is in the, in the detail. So they used uh, ReLU 
uh, as their activations rather than sigmoid or tan hate or any of those uh, and in fact it was it was these guys that that showed that relu could um uh, you know could converge maybe six times faster than if you were using some of the other uh, activations there was a normalization layer uh, used there which they're not really used anymore there are other types of normalization that we use particularly batch normalization and sometimes instance normalization and um, I'll there's also spectral normalization is, a, is another type of normalization I'll come back and talk about that, that a little bit more next week batch normalization is probably the most important of those to discuss um, so I'll go through that in a little bit of detail it's also relatively easy to understand but they're they're all this, the, uh, a, a similar idea what they also used in order to win at this ImageNet challenge was they um, they used seven of these CNNs in parallel. And so what would happen is you'd put the, the images through seven of these. It wasn't seven copies. It was seven individually, um, individually trained ones. And because of the stochasticity of the, of the training mechanisms where, where it's using sto stochastic gradient descent, you end up with a situation where um, each one of these is giving out slight, you know, slightly different results. Uh, so a little bit like we saw with the random forest idea. And from that, you can normally get yourself a few extra percent in terms of uh, the overall results. So they use seven of these as an ensemble. Some of the training details, they use dropout of 0 0.5. I'll be explaining next week what dropout is. They used a batch size of 128. So this is how many images they put through um, at a time before doing a training update. So they don't, you don't put the entire set of training images through before doing an update, you, you use a, a batch. And the size of that batch has a has an effect, usually in terms of, of regularization, in that the larger the batch size that you use, the more representative of the entire data set it will be, okay? Uh, they used a lot of data augmentation. Again, I'll mention a little bit about some of the different types of data augmentation you can do next week. But effectively, this means that you take a particular image and you do some modifications to it to make several copies of it that are, that are all slightly different. And that can give you some robustness to the types of changes that can happen to images. They used uh, stochastic gradient descent with momentum. Again, I'll only be giving some very brief details next week about some of the different types of optimi optimization techniques, but one of these is, is stochastic gradient descent with momentum, and that momentum is, is important. The momentum they used is 0 0.9. Again, I'll give you a very brief description of that next week. I'd love to give a full lecture on it, but what I'll do is I'll give you um, some, uh, some resources that you can go and read up on those yourselves. They used a learning rate of one, um, one by ten, 10 to the minus two, so um, 0 0.01 effectively. Um, and this was reduced by a factor of 10 each time the validation ac accuracy plateaued. So this is something that we see where um, you're watching the validation accuracy and it starts to kind of plateau in this way. So what they do at that point after it's plateaued for a certain amount of time, it doesn't seem to be improving. They change the learning rate down to usually a, a factor of 10 times lower. And then we see a similar sort of thing happen and then it plateaus again and then they do the same sort of thing again. Um, there's diminishing returns in this, um, but uh, but it does, does have an effect. Uh, some of the other types of optimization techniques um, take some of this into account and so therefore it's not as important in those but with SG with momentum uh, it can be useful this is carried out manually so uh, in in many cases what you would do is you would check the validation um, uh, automatically that's how we would usually do it now and we would decide when to change down uh, you would decide in an automatic manner when to change down your um, your learning rate uh, but uh, in this particular case, they did it manually. Obviously, it was, they, were, they were breaking new ground. So the architecture looks a little more complicated than it actually was. The problem was that there was not enough memory on the GPUs at the time to fit the whole model on a single GPU. So the diagram shows it split across two GPUs. Not insignificant uh, how difficult that was for them at the time, because at the time, there wasn't really all the... Um, the frameworks that we have now, like TensorFlow or Theano or, or uh, PyTorch or any of those. So they had to do a lot of this in C++ and therefore that was uh, considerably more difficult than we have it today with regard to um, being able to split it across different GPUs and so on. Uh, can I all just check that you're all still there and you can hear me properly? I've been talking for, a, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a very talky one tonight. That's great, thanks guys. Um, so. 
This next one is one that I've shown before. It's called VGG Net, and it comes out of the Visual Geometry Group at Oxford. Um, for any of you that are, have, some of you did the multiple view geometry with me last year, and some of you will be doing it next semester with me as well. Um, the the principal book in multiple view geometry, um, one of the one of the co-authors of that is is An uh, Andrew Zisserman, uh, who's this guy here. So despite the fact that there's not a bit of deep learning in the, in that particular textbook, um, I think it, it kind of predates the deep learning age. Um, but uh, this guy's sister man was um, a, a really important figure going right back into the old days of uh, computer vision. But he's obviously like anybody else in computer vision. He's moved on to use a lot of deep learning techniques. Um, so this is a very high profile guy um, and Presumably his, his student, either postdoc or, um, or, or post doc or post grad, um, uh, Karen uh, Simonian, um, worked on this idea of the VGG network. Um, so their idea was uh, can we get a very deep convolutional network for large scale uh, image recognition? And what they were trying to see was could they go deeper and could they also. Um, kind of streamline the architecture in rather than what we saw here in AlexNet where we had like um, 11 by 11 and 5 by 5 and so on, all these different filter sizes, they wanted to go for a much simpler idea and say, well, can we can we go a bit deeper and can we use all 3 by 3, um, 3 by 3 Convy filters with a stride of 1 and use 2 by 2 max pooling. So a much simpler in terms of describing the network. It doesn't mean it's simpler in terms of its um, the complexity of the number of parameters and so on that's involved. Indeed, this was a very large network in terms of number of parameters. Um, they, they started with uh, an input of 224 by 224. And the, sorry, it's, it's actually this 224 and this 224 is what I meant to, to look at and, and by three, obviously. So the, these are color images. And what you can see is that they've um, they've changed that to uh, 224 by 224 by 64, first of all. Then they resize down. So they've resized by half with that pooling to 112 by 112 um, with 128 as their... Uh, as the thing, so you can see that this has gone 64, 128, 256, 512, and so on. So it's it's that they're doubling they're doubling the depth uh, in most of the cases, um, and they're uh, resizing down to half of the half the resolution in in both X and Y. Okay, uh, now they normally go through a few convolutional layers, as you can see here, before each downsampling. So again, quite a simple idea of this. They've used 224 and 224 by 224 as an input. And the reason that they've done that is that when you do a, uh, um, a divide by two and a divide by two and a divide by two, it allows you quite a number of divide by twos before you end up with, a, with an odd number. The odd number here being the seven by seven that they eventually end up with here. Okay, so that seven by seven then, which they have a seven by seven by five one two, um, it's is obviously a very small size that you know they've 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 worked it down to a, a very small dimensionality seven by seven by five one two which they then change into um, one by one thousand uh, one by one by one thousand um, which is where they want to work to in order to get to their classification which is the one thousand classes of um, of ImageNet which is what they want to check it against. Very, very important network. They tried a number of different ones, uh, 11 up to, to 19. The um, the most important of these were 16 and 19, which were the two quite popular ones, um, the ones that were were, uh, were winning um, are, are coming very close to winning the the, the ImageNet. So they, they came second in classif the classification, which is probably the most important category on ImageNet, but they came first in localization. So it wasn't a clear winner uh, across the board in that particular year. You can see how um, how influential this paper has been. Uh, almost twenty eight thousand citations, and that's for a paper that's come out only five years ago. That's an enormous number of citations in that short amount of time. So it does just show how important this network has been. It does have a few um, a few problems. Uh, one of which is it uses an absolutely enormous number of um, of parameters. Um, so because of the because of that um and also actually it uses quite a bit of memory too 
So because of the number of parameters and the, the, the amount of memory, it's not really a good system if you wanted to deploy this on something like an embedded system. Okay, you, you probably steer clear of it, but we we do use it. In fact, I'm 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 toying with this for for your next assignment. I'll probably get you to use a VGG network. Um, if if I specify which network I'm going to get you to use, I'll probably get you to use a, a, one of these, and it'll be a, a pre um a pre-trained network. Uh, and it's simply because it's it's quite easy to deal with, and then and then then look at the at the other things that that, that I want you to look at. So, various steps were tried, and while 19 layers was the best, it was only a small improvement on 16 layers. So, 16 layers might be the optimum given the fact that it it uses um, uh, you know uh, a bit less memory and so on. Uh, you can see the difference there in numbers of parameters: 138 million versus 144 million. Um, so can you calculate the memory required at each layer? So I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you. You can look at, at any one of these and look back and see, can you figure out you know, what would the bit memory usage be at each layer and how many parameters would it use at each layer? And the reason that I've, I've kind of set this, you can you can do this as an exercise yourself, is that you can see how many, uh, how many parameters you need to come up with overall. Um, so therefore you can work down through this and see, uh, see can you come out with the, with the right answer. You should find that the layers closer to the input um, use the most memory, but the fewest parameters and vice versa as you get, get to this end. We use less memory up here, but uh, far more parameters. Okay, so that's that's the, the VGG, um, the, the idea of the VGG network. Uh, some other uh, issues about, about training the VGG network. So similar to training, um, similar training to AlexNet, there was none of the normalization layers that we saw we saw earlier. Now a lot of people have kind of modified these since and put in things like batch normalization and so on, but there was none of the normalization layers that we saw um, in the previous one. Um, they also use an ensemble of seven networks um, for 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 doing their calculation uh, or for doing their final um, judgment. One other thing to note for later is that uh, the features of the last fully connected layer. Um, the last fully uh, FC4096 layer, which is this one here, um, they found that that generalized well to other tasks. Now, what we mean by that is that if you train this on ImageNet, you're training it on the thousand classes of ImageNet. So you've got whatever number of million images there that you're using, um, and they, they, they conform to a thousand classes that you're looking for. But what they found was that the, the sort of things that were learned throughout the network throughout all that, uh, coming all the way down to basically um, a very small dimensionality here of only 4,096 um, uh, 4,096 activations, which are effectively a representation of a, of the dimensionality where it's, it's now down to 4,096 dimensions um, from being an image of 224 by 224 by 3. That what they found was that that, that representation there generalized quite well to other tasks and what that meant was that you could in effect come along here and you could remove this section here so remove the fully connected layer um the, that changes it to 1000 and you could remove what the the softmax layer this here at the top i'll mention a bit about that later um and then put a new one on top so let's say, for example, that you wanted to retrain this for something else that had only three classes in it. Well, what you do is you'd have a fully connected layer with just three in it. And then what you'd have is you'd have a softmax layer here, which is softmax is, is, is effectively the generalization of uh, logistic regression. So it's used for classification. Um, so what you'd have then at that stage is you, you would retrain this network. Uh, you'd leave everything here unchanged. Sorry, and including this, including this section, you'd leave all that unchanged, and um, what you would what you would do. So, in other words, you wouldn't tra retrain those layers, but you would retrain the ones in the red box here. Not retrain them; you'd actually usually replace them with a new initialization and train them from scratch. And what that would do is it would basically say that even though the images that you were now training on might be very different from the original, you, you know, might be a different sort of thing that you're looking for than ImageNet classes that what those early layers learned generalized well to other tasks. Now that's useful because it's useful for this technique which we call transfer learning, which I've just described to you there. Um, and that's what I plan to get you to do as part of your second assignment is to take a pre-trained network, 
it takes weeks to train these networks and it would take you even longer if you don't have a GPU. So I don't really want to give you that as an assignment. So instead, what we're going to have as an assignment is that you're going to uh, fine tune or transfer learn to some other um, task that we want to do. And you're going to reuse the part of the network that um, that has already generalized quite well. So that's that's the plan for that. And that's the, the idea um, of, of transfer learning. Now, the next one is called Google Net. And, and by the time we've got to this, we're, um, we're running into a problem that you, you can't even really show the full network or you can't show it very well on a slide. You can see some of these boxes are so small, there's no possible way that you could read them. I'll show you the, 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 them in a bit more detail in a moment. Now, this is also uh, often known as inception. Okay, and we might think of this as inception version one. Now, it was called Google with the L here, because obviously it was created in Google, but it, this was kind of a homage back to um, to the original Linet. Um, uh, but in actual fact, it, it, it's, it was really only homage to that. It's not like it was really using things that were, um, apart from the obvious idea of the convolution, uh, they, they, these guys came up with quite a, lo a lot uh, of new ideas. Okay. Um, and so it was this um, this guy, uh, Segedi is obviously the... the um, the, the the main author here but you can see that there's quite a number of people here that were working in google and the, and, and possibly some other uh, academic um collaborators um how many have we on this we've one two three four five six seven eight nine i think it's nine people that worked on this and um, so so quite, quite a large group here so very difficult to attribute um attribute this to just to just one person which is often what happens the first name it's usually the person who did the majority of the work um, but but it can mean that the the other people that come later if they did a lot of work can get forgotten because you might say segedi ad ad et al again you can see how influential this has been 16089 and the chances are that if you go and you add up the there's been four different versions of inception up to v4 if you go and add up the citations for all four of them it probably comes to a very very large number indeed um, and they were all s slight improvements on it so this is the one that it bet vgg on the classification in 2012 sorry 2014 apologies um so the name is a homage to the original leanet uh, but is actually uh, quite a novel design it's 22 layers in total, but it's made up of what are called inception modules. They don't use any fully connected layers, and this greatly reduces the number of parameters and hence the computation required for inference. So I showed that previously, that the number of parameters in the fully, in the fully connected layers um, uh, are, are absolutely enormous. Indeed, the number of parameters is only 5 million. And um, if you compare this uh, to its direct competitor, VGG, in 2014, that the two of them were kind of um, back and forth as regards which which part of the the, the uh, image net that they won, VGG used between 138 and 144 million for the one that that uh, it was its direct competitor versus five million. So there's an enormous difference in terms of the number of computations here. What Inception um, uh, managed, there was a kind of a trend at first where the you know as we progressed with GPUs, then we went just went to more complex networks that just had more parameters. And this is the first time that they went no no we can we can maybe come up with a, a more efficient way of doing this um, and even alex you know so alexnet started 60 60 million parameters vgg went up to uh, well over 100 million parameters but inception uh, the first inception one was only 5 million parameters um, so that was a major improvement as well which is why this one is so popular when it comes to modifying it for for use in you know in other you know where you might be including several networks together and so on because it's a good bit more efficient in that way so it works on this idea of the inception module so you can see this module here and um, there's there's a number of them in here in each in each different case and we, we we have several of them on the on the way through so this first uh version of the inception module is not the one that got used but it gives us an idea of how it works first so the naive version is not used in practice as it's computationally complex uh, so it, it, it wouldn't have uh, solved that problem of of the vast numbers of of um calculations but it does give us the basic idea of the inception module so the idea is to look in a, um, at multiple receptive fields at the one time so from a previous layer here what we would do is we would have a, a one by one a three by three and a five by five 
um, convolution and we'd also maybe have a max pooling layer in there as well. And what we would do is um, for each one of these, we would have to go through the entire depth of the previous layer. So that would mean it, it would effectively be like having, uh, well, certainly three layers and the max pooling is, is um, doesn't need as many parameters, but um, it doesn't really need any parameters. But uh, but uh, we, we can see here that for, for each of these three, it's like having three separate layers. And what we then do is we concatenate them. So whatever number of these that we wanted, let's say we wanted 256 of them, what we would end up with is... Um, uh, a depth here of 256, sorry, 256, and another two, 256, and another 256 on top of that after we concatenate them all on top, and then whatever comes from the max pooling. So the problem with that is that that required a huge number of calculations. And so what they decided to do first was they decided to say, let's um, change down, let's do a dimensionality reduction uh, before, after each layer, do a dimensionality reduction before we then send it into um, into these three ones here. And overall, then we'll get a gain from the fact that we're looking at it at different um, receptive fields. Uh, so we'll see slightly different things, but the dimensionality uh, reduction before that will take care of the fact that um, you know that we're using quite a that that, that we we'll be using quite a lot of parameters. So that's the idea of what they did. So they did a series of one by one convolutions here and here. They didn't have to do that for the one by one convolution here, obviously, um, but they did have to do it for these three by three and five by five. And they could then decide, well, how many of these did they want? Um, uh, so they could so they could have a uh, you know a, a smaller um, depth uh, overall for from from the previous layer that's coming in, so that when they all get concatenated together, they kind of go back up to the same, maybe the same depth that they originally started with or whatever depth that they wanted on the output. So the version opposite is used instead. Here, one by one convolutions are used before the three by three and five by five, uh, so as to reduce the depth of these and hence the number of calculations. Now, these one by one convolutions, people get confused by them a lot as to wh what would be the point of them. But remember that the one by one convolutions still go through the entire depth. So it's not like one by one convolutions only have a single parameter. If the depth from the previous one was 256, these are one by one by 256. And what they do is they go through the entire set uh, for that particular pixel uh, position and do a, do a calculation for it. And then the number of those that we the number of those filters that we have gives us our, our next step that we're going to have. So, um, so one by one convolution is a means to reduce the dimensionality, hopefully without losing important information. Um, so we reduce the dimensionality, but we don't we, we don't reduce the 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 you know the x and y coordinates here. In effect, what it does is it combines responses, or which is basically a linear combination of the responses, and then it puts them through a nonlinearity. So there's a lot of complexity in there. Uh, by complexity, I mean in terms of the complexity of the function. That's that we're trying to model, uh, and it does that from the layer below and into combined responses, but only over a single pixel and then throughout the full depth. So this turned out to be a much more. Um, it turned out to be very powerful, but also turned out to be um, quite efficient in terms of uh, its number of parameters that it was using. Okay, the specifics of how many of each of these. Um, you know, you can find that you can find that detail, but again, people have tweaked that over time to come up with different different types of ones. This idea of, you know, taking um, reducing the dimensionality, um, it's called a bottleneck. So it's the idea of, of of pushing it into. You can kind of think of it as pushing it into a bottleneck. So this is very efficient and produces far fewer operations and uses far fewer parameters as well. Um, it bet VGG net overall in the ImageNet challenge, despite using only 5 million parameters to the VGG's 138 to 144 million parameters. You may think that given that, that VGG would then be forgotten about, but actually, and most of the time that, you know, the kind of second place architectures did kind of get forgotten about. Um, but VGG was such a simple idea um, that it was it was a very important one. So that's why it, it, it still has a, a huge number of, of citations. Okay, so what happened here, uh, this, this paper ResNet um, by Kaming He and his, his collaborators, 
they uh, they wanted to know whether depth uh, whether an increase in depth made a difference uh, to the training because this assumption that if we have more depth we have more layers and therefore we have more changes in representation that can take place and therefore presumably the more depth we have if we just keep going to deeper and deeper networks that must surely improve the situation so what they first found uh, or what a lot of people first found was that if you went to more layers it did not generalize quite as well. In other words, your test error, your validation error had a gap between it. And I've, I've drawn that here. OK, so we, we, have a, we have a gap there between those. And we can see that the more layers you have, um, the poorer the test error was. So this seemed unusual and they assumed that it just wasn't, uh, it was maybe overfitting to the data. But then they checked it against, um, they, they looked at the training error and they found that even the training error um, was worse at uh, when you had more layers like this. So what was going on? Now there are a number of things that can happen. One is the thing that we call vanishing gradients. Uh, by the way, just before I go on to the next slide, you can see that there's a very sudden drop here in both of these at a particular point. That's just due to a change in the um, in the learning rate as we showed earlier. Do you remember when I, I said earlier we had a kind of a leveling out and then we do that again and we do it again and we see this with, with, with the training error. So, um, that's all that that is, but you can still see the gap that's happening between them. So the the initial assumption um, is that this is something to do with vanishing gradient. And indeed, this is what ResNet has become famous for, even though in their own paper, they actually said that they didn't have a problem, that the 56 layer model did not necessarily have a problem with the um, with vanishing gradients. Um, but nonetheless, it does solve this particular problem. Now, they had some other ideas about what might be happening um, and and their solution to it. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's actually become far more far more famous for just solving the vanishing or one of the solutions to the vanishing gradient problem. And it has also meant that you can go to really extreme depths as well. So we previously, me previously mentioned this vanishing gradient problem. And the idea of the vanishing gradient was that as your gradient is coming back through each of the functions, you had to multiply the upstream gradient by the, 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 the local gradient that you, that you were calculating. And if the local gradient was zero at any point, that meant that when it was an upstream gradient for the next thing down down the stream, you then had zero gradient coming and it didn't matter what the local gradient was, it was multiplied by zero. And what could happen was that as these gradients got smaller and smaller, they got choked off. And therefore, in very deep networks, it was very difficult to back propagate from the loss function all the way back through the network down to the bottom. And for that to continue, because it really only had you only had to get into a bad place somewhere in your training for this to happen and, and not be able to recover from it. If you've zero gradient at any point, it's very difficult to learn from that. So you can't really learn your way out. It's a, it's, it's 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 kind of the, the, the end of it. So during back propagation, if the gradient becomes vanishingly small at some point in the network, then we choke off the gradient flowing back to earlier parts of the network. The ResNet architecture gets around this problem by having skip connections every few layers and this allows the gradient to flow back. It should be noted, as I said, that the original paper suggested there are other reasons for the poor performance than simp the poor performance of deeper layers than simply the vanishing gradient problem and they show that even when the gradient does not vanish, deeper nets perform worse if they are not residual. Uh, using this, this ResNet idea, when they used the ResNet idea, it did seem to solve those problems. Uh, they make conjectures on other reasons, but they, they leave the work for later research and I'm I didn't follow that particular line of research as to where they went or whether they did later work on it. Um, ResNets have, as I say, become associated with solving the vanishing gradient problem um, because they certainly will will solve that. There are other things that solve it as well. Bash normalization is very good for that. Um, but uh, but th this was one particular um, uh, mechanism that they used. So below is a, a 34 layer ResNet. Um, but they they did create examples that were 50 layers, 101 layers, 152 layers, and so on. I think they probably got tired at that stage. Um, we're showing a 34 layer network, but I think uh, even that it's not showing all 34 layers. You just you just couldn't show it all on the on the one slide. So um, what you can see here is that th there's a huge amount of repetition goes on. So this looks like a much simpler network than um, than we saw with something like Inception. And you can see that there are these skip connections here, and the, these are effectively 
uh, a straight you can think of them like almost like a wire um, you know there's a straight through connection uh, between these different points so it looks like a bypass but it's not exactly because of, of how they're connected in should obviously give them credit uh, 32,697 citations for a network for a paper that came out in 2015 so um, let's have a look at the network now they tend to do things uh, right to left and uh, top to bottom. So that's where this, this diagram has come. I actually flipped this diagram to make it look a bit more like we're used to seeing. But um, what, we're, what we're assuming here is that we're, we're coming from the input here to the output. And this is each one of these, right? So what they have is usually like a convolutional layer here, a convolutional layer here. They've got relus in between as their, activ as their activations. What they do is they take the input here, they bring it around like that, and they add it into whatever comes through the, um, the convolutional layers. So the idea behind the residual block is that the standard convolutional block H of X can be replaced by simply um, learning to determine how H of X differs from the input. So what, what you basically do is you learn, um, you learn what you want to learn, but you say, well, okay, I only want to learn the important difference between uh, my input and what my backpropagation algorithm or my loss function says that I really need to be at at this point. So this is what we call the residual. So we take our input image or activations that we have and we only learn the difference which we call the residual. So this is given by uh, h of x equals f of x, uh, the residual plus the input. Um, so we really only want to learn f of x and we call that the residual. Now the idea here is that if we get, remember back, back propagation, right? So if we get to here and we find that something in, in here has given a zero gradient, okay? The problem that we run into there is that in the previous cases we couldn't really back propagate through those layers very easily okay but in this current case if we find that what we've learned there chokes off the gradient and there is no, therefore is not particularly useful then we can just go straight around the um we can go straight around the blockage there because there's you you basically just have an identity here which is just one so therefore there's the 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 derivative with respect to it is basically just the the the, the gradient just sails around this and goes to the goes to the previous layer okay so that means that uh, effectively you have a bypass of anywhere where the gradient goes to zero if it doesn't and we learn something useful in this layer then the gradient can also pass straight through there as well and the two gradients meet at the other side and combine so as can be seen in the diagram opposite, if the convolutions learn nothing, then X is left unchanged. But if it learns that it needs to change X, then this will be learned as the residual F of X. If during the back prop, uh, the gradient is choked off in the actions of a particular layer, then the gradient can still flow around the identity X. This means that while the gradient may be zero for some section of the network, it does not affect unrelated layers below it. Um, it allowed training of very deep networks and it was very useful uh, or is very successful on the ImageNet challenge. So as I say, they, they were able to extend from like, you know, 22 layer networks up to 152 layer networks without, um, with, without problem. Uh, and it, it, it won uh, in, I think, 20, 2015. So um, this was a really good paper then that came out in, I haven't written down the date there, I think it was 2016 this paper came out and they looked at, um, might have been a little bit later, they looked at um, a lot of the famous networks and, and slight modifications of them that had won the ImageNet challenge and decided to do a comparison of them in terms of how well they would work if you were actually using them in what they said were you know, practical practical applications okay so what happens if you're using these in practical application so the idea was that what they were saying was yeah okay you can use ImageNet but if you just throw um, any amount of power at solving ImageNet that doesn't really tell us how useful that would be if we then wanted to use it in a real system so some of the things that they they wanted to know were well firstly what was your total your what was your accuracy so how did these compare in terms of ImageNet 
And you can see that as time went on through these, um, that the performance on ImageNet became better. So some of the ones that we've looked at tonight are, um, we looked at AlexNet. You can see there's a version here called um, BN, which stands for Batch Normalization used with AlexNet. So that's when somebody came in and decided to use Batch Normalization, um, which was uh, something that came along later and I'll be discussing it more next week. Um, there's this other one called Network and Network, which we didn't do, ENet. Um, we did do Google Net. We looked at tonight. We we looked at um, we looked at some of the ResNets, and you can see that there's a ResNet with only 18, then a ResNet with 34, a ResNet with 50, a ResNet with 101, a ResNet with 152. So you can see as they went deeper, they were able to achieve better performance, and that was part of what they wanted to show. Was they assumed that if you went deeper, you should get better performance, but that all sorts of issues confounded that. But if you use this residual network with these bypasses you were able to improve on it. Now, we can see that um, the original Google Net uh, is, which one is this down? It's this one here. That's the original Google Net there, but which is the first version of Inception, but different versions of Inception came out later, Inception V3 and Inception V4, which improved again on that performance. Um, so, so you can see that uh, as time went on, the, these got better. But we see quite a different story when it comes to their actual, uh, the ability to actually use these in a real system. So um, there's three things that are actually on, that are on this thing. Firstly, there's the accuracy here. So how do they improve in terms of accuracy? In this side here, we look at how many operations, in other words, how many parameters it took in order to do a, a pass, to a single forward pass of one image through this network in order to do a prediction. The other thing, though, that it shows, and I sh should have written this, I've, I've forgotten to write this in the in the, in the the figure legend here, is that um, they also show, in terms of the size of the circle here, tells us how much memory was required to actually store this on a GPU. Okay, so what we can see here is that, in general, we have a kind of a trend, um, we have a kind of a trend that goes like follows, um, goes along like that which is to say that as our operations go up, in general, our accuracy goes up. So the number of parameters in general, um, the, the more parameters we have in general, the uh, accuracy goes up. However, there's diminishing returns, as we can see here. It's, it's not continuing to go in a linear fashion like that. It's, uh, it's, going, in a, it's going in a kind of a, a curve here. Um, so they're maybe not improving too much beyond that. But it is also fair to say that that, is, that tends to be the way with accuracy. The last few percentage of accuracy always tends to be a little bit more difficult. So that's the first thing that we can see here. But we can also see that um, we have some significant outliers here in terms of VGG. So VGG is an outlier in terms of the fact that the number of parameters that are required versus the performance that it gets in terms of accuracy is not is not brilliant. It, it requires far more parameters uh, in order to get the accuracy uh, of an equivalent um, ResNet or, a, um, or an Inception or GoogleNet or any of those. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you can see by the size of the bubble that the number of parameters that are required um, by the uh, by VGG is much larger. We can see a general trend that as well that um, certainly in terms of this that as we get into this section of it here um, to get this improvement in accuracy, we also have a tendency to end up with 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 larger um, larger architectures that require um, more memory. Okay, so this was, uh, I think this is really an excellent graph in terms of, it's not something I would ask you to reproduce in terms of, a, of an exam or anything like that, but it is something for you to be very aware of when it comes to, um, to where you might use some of these architectures. So for example, uh, while I said that I might get you to use VGG um, for your assignment, uh, that's because of, of the ease of this network in order to, to play around with it. Um, however, if you were to actually try and deploy this in something like uh, an autonomous vehicle, you can see that the amount of memory and the amount of pr uh, calculations that would be required uh, would be too heavy for most embedded systems. And then there's the energy requirement. And we can see here that the energy requirement, you can see these two green ones up the top. And they are, of course, 
VGG as well. So why are they using so much energy um, for, a, for a single image? Oh, sorry, this is time I'm looking at here. That's time. Today of energy. Energy is on the next one. Um, so we'll come back to that. So this is the amount of time. Again, it uh, you can see VGG is a poor performer here because of the fact um, that they uh, they have so many parameters to, uh, of calculations to, to pass through. Um, and this is for the amount of time in milliseconds for a single image to pass through. And it's looking at maybe 200 milliseconds there. So you're talking about maybe only five frames per second, uh, which would also be very slow for something like a real-time application. Um, on the, and this depends on how many batch, you know, how many images you're allowed to put through in a single go, of course, as well. And you can see that there's actually not much improvement in VGG, even if you put 16 images through at the one time. Whereas uh, this yellow one, which is, um, the yellow one is actually AlexNet, which is, um, is interesting to see it that it improves with the match size as we as we pass it through and um, but of course not as good a performance as we saw earlier um this red one network and network where are our uh, inception v4 so yeah you can see inception v4 there it's it's up here and your inception v3 is up here so again um while they're very good in terms of accuracy, you can now see that in terms of the speed of their operation because of the number of parameters and so on that they're using uh, compared to something like um, so, so, some, some of the simpler ones, um, you can see that uh, it, it it can't get the throughput quite so quick. So even though we might use a, a smaller footprint for these or it might have very good accuracy, you can see the problems that we might have in terms of just getting the throughput of images because Getting the right answer is no good if it's too late. Uh, and this is a big problem that we have in real-time systems like uh, like autonomous vehicles. This is the energy one now, the architecture, which is a little bit more muddled. Um, VGG and ResNet, which is the amount of power uh, per batch size, the net power consumption that it's going to use. And you can see here that um, they're kind of much of a muchness. They're, they're a little bit all over the place. Uh, so, it's, so it's a little bit difficult. And... You know, it's 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 not as easy to determine, obviously, for this um, how much uh, how much you know uh, actual energy is going to be consumed um, uh, for for these networks because there's a little bit more complexity to it than simply just looking at the number of parameters. There's no guarantee that the the number of you you can only do a certain number of calculations within a particular time, and that's where we see a little bit more. Um, complexity here in terms of uh, how much energy is used for each one of these. Do bear in mind that this is looking at the um, the energy compared to the size of the batch. It doesn't really it doesn't tell the tale of what the the amount of energy per minute might be or the amount of energy per image that we might be getting. Um, you know, if if we were looking at a uh, number of frames. So if we wanted to put a second of information, you know, you know maybe 30 frames or 60 frames through this doesn't quite answer that question. You'd have to do a little bit more manipulation in order to figure that out. Okay, um, so but you can see there that obviously there's a little bit of thought to be put into that if we were to actually use them. So I'm going to end tonight on a slightly different note from where we've been going previously. But one of the things that I wanted to explain was how we get from these neural networks, uh, which are very complex, to doing something like a classifier that literally just tells you, uh, okay, it's a dog, it's a cat, it's a pedestrian, it's a cyclist. How do we do that? So in general, what I'm going to show you, now obviously I haven't shown a convolutional neural network here, but I'm basically getting, showing, um, you know, this section here basically represents my, my overall neural network. We end up coming down to a fully connected layer. So you'll see most of those had fully connected layer, fully connected layer, fully connected layer, and then they had their output. So you can assume that these networks go way back here in terms of depth and they might have convolutional layers and so on. Now, the idea is that let's say we have um, we have three things. Uh, so I'll just make them up here on the spot. We have road pixels. We have or you know, we, we, we want to recognize a road. We want to recognize traffic light. Actually, what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll think about the problem that I'm planning on giving you, which is. Well, sorry, yeah, yeah, I was going to get you to do different road signs. So um, let's say stop, stop sign, yield, and maybe uh, no sign as, as three examples. 
Now, what you can see here is that for each of these, each one of these uses is attached to every one of these here. OK, so it's its own little classification that's there. And what we've got to be able to do is we've got to be able to say, well, OK, which one of these came out the most convinced that it has the right answer? And what we would need to be able to see is that it was higher than either of these two, if we were to say that it's the stop sign. So that's the idea. And they all have each of their own parameters. So while this one here has its own set of parameters that go to each one of these, from there on back the way, it shares the parameters with everything else. Okay, so this one uh, has the exact same set of parameters in this section as well, but it's, it only changes when it gets to effectively this layer here. So that's the, the, the idea of the classification. So, uh, and I forgot to write the title for these. Here are two loss functions that we might use for a, um, uh, a, a, a neural network that was then going to do classification. And the first one is called multi-class SVM, which of course you looked at these support ve um, vector machines before, but we tended to think of them as they were just trying to divide between two classes. Now we're, we're looking at what happens in the multi-class example. The second one is called the softmax function, which as I said to you, was an extension of logistic regression when we, um, when we extended to the multiple class. Let's have a quick look at these, but we won't spend too long on them. So the first thing is that what we have to do is we have to say um, we have our label here, which is YI. And what we do is we go through, let's say uh, we have a set of labels here that says the the answer in the first case is that's our label one and these ones are zero and zero. OK, so we know that this is the one that it should be. And we then want to look at the results. So we then take the function that says, OK, the input image XI comes in and it goes through the parameters that are related to J. And J is basically which one of these that we're dealing with, 0, 1, or 2. Now, the thing is that the weights for um, for any particular version of this will be mostly the same apart from these last few. Okay, so these last few weights here will be different but everything that goes before it will be the same. So that's why we, we specify the function and we specify the weights, but actually most of those weights will be the same apart from the last few that make the determination. And what we do is um, for each of the others, so let's say, for example, we have a stop sign in this particular case. What we do is we compare it to whatever output we get for the yield sign and for the no sign. Okay. So we, we run through, th through two of these in this particular case and we compare... The, the, the one that we get for the stop sign with the, the, the ones that we get for the yield sign and then we compare it with the, the stop sign with the no sign. And what we want is that we want the difference between those two to be um, to be basically a, a if, if, if it's the stop sign that's, uh, that's the higher number, when we subtract it from this number, we'll get an overall negative number. And if that negative, if we have a negative number and we're using a max function, then zero will be bigger than that negative number. And therefore, we will add zero to our overall loss. So the idea is that if we've got the right lay, if we've got the, the, if the output from the stop sign, which is the correct one, is bigger than, e than the other one in each case, um, then we add nothing to the loss. If, however, it's smaller than it, then we need to add something to the loss because we got the thing wrong. What we might want to do in SVM is we want to, might want to have a bit of a margin of error. We might want to say, well, the stop sign has to be bigger by a certain margin uh, before and otherwise we will uh, we will give it some loss and therefore we add a margin into this. Now, we give that margin as delta. You may remember in the SVM when we looked at it, we gave that we gave that just as a value of one. And if you remember, we didn't mean that we wanted the margin always to be one. We used the value one because it was the identity for multiplication. And we used this section over here, which was the size of the weights, as a mechanism to maximize the margin. So it effectively got multiplied by that one. However, we have a, delta, we have a little symbol delta here to suggest that we might use a value other than one. Now, many people will just put in a value of one there, and that's, that's usually fine. However, you may remember from SVM that rather than lambda, we actually had a value over here, which was a value of C, which is kind of just the same as one over lambda. 
So you might say, well, just using lambda here, that makes that makes no odds. Where it does make a change, however, is that when we're maximizing the margin, the the um, parameters that we're concerned about are these ones here. Okay, so the, the these parameters these parameters basically in this section here. We're not concerned about the rest of the parameters for maximizing the margin. However, this is being used as an overall regularization term. So basically that value of lambda then affects the overall generalization of our network. So remember regularization is used to generalize the network so that it's it's not overfitting. So now we've this multitasking, this lambda value, and remember it's a hyperparameter, so we pick some value for that. So because it's multitasking, if we pick a value that suits us for our over underfitting, that might affect our ability to get the margin that we want. If on the other hand we we compromise you know if 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 we choose that lambda value purely for getting our maximizing our margin, that might compromise our over or underfitting. So therefore that's why we have this extra parameter here, the delta, because it allows us to tweak that a little bit and say Okay, it's not so important what your value of lambda is. If we want to maximize the margin, we can set this value of delta to maybe something bigger than one or smaller than one so that uh, we can then have this lambda um, concentrate a little bit more on being a regularizer for the network. So that's the idea there. And this is how, how it works. And as you can see, we, we do this for the stop versus yield. And then because of this addition here, we then do it for the stop versus uh, no sign. And of course, if we had a thousand of these categories, we would do, uh, we do, we'd, we'd run through a thousand of these or 999 of them, because obviously we don't include the one that's the label. And then we have this summation that says, we'll do this for each of the samples that you're putting through. So whatever many samples you have in your batch, um, that would be this would be the size of the batch or it would be the size of the entire data set depending on which you were doing mostly this would be a batch so that's how we use multi-class SVM we can also use logistic regression as we did previously um, for you know for, for classification uh, looks like a bit more complex of a function but effectively you're using the log function um, because of the fact that this is a uh, it's, it's, it's an, a non-convex non function and we have here um, the you can kind of see the the the, the kind of idea of the of the sigma here again, where we put our decide the sigmoid, where we get our function for the label that we're interested in, and we compare that to the sum of all of the other ones put together, and we divide one into the other, and then we get the log of that to see just to, to see where we are. Once again, we can do a kind of a regularization on this uh, over the parameters. And again, we have to do it over all of the layers. Um, so again, this, this, this uses a similar idea. Um, so this basically takes our logistic regression idea and then says, well, okay, how would this, how would this deal with the situation um, where we had, um, where we had uh, multiple outputs? So for example, in this particular case, let's say, for example, we had something like 0 0.5 for this, um, so in other words, that we're 0 0.5, sure, it was the stop sign, but we might be something like 0 0.4 here on this one and 0 0.3 here on this one. Now, if you look at that, that doesn't add up to one and it needs to. So what we would do is we would um, we'd have our 0 0.5 here, obviously, with the exponential involved. And you'd have the 0 0.5 plus the 0 0.4 plus the 0 0.3 so that we're, we're making sure to basically do a normalization here on the bottom uh, so that we then get an idea of not just how sure is this of its answer, but how sure is it in comparison to the other answers. So it's just using a slightly different idea really in terms of um, of how to determine this, okay? And that's pretty much it for tonight. Have I two sets of, oh yeah, I had the references there and I'd, I'd, I'd remove that. So this is some of our acknowledgements for tonight. So Ian Goodfellow, Yoshio Benjo and Aaron Corville, who uh, who obviously wrote the Deep Learning book um, and that is available online. Francois Chalet, the Deep Learning uh, with Python. He's the guy that developed uh, Keras, as I said, and again, has written a very good book. Um, the CS231N uh, from Stanford, that's their course there. Um, it's in the most recent version is delivered by Fifi Lee, Justin, uh, Fifi Lee is the, the, the main lady there. Justin Johnson, Serena Yuang are two of the, the people who deliver the module and Andrew Carpathy, who now works for 
Tesla um, uh, wrote most of the notes when he was there at Stanford. There's also, uh, I think this is actually, I think I left that in from last week, but that's um, our Tiano Convolutional Arithmetic uh, tutorial. It's worth uh, it's worth clicking on that again, just to see how those convolutions work. And uh, this is the system that I use for drawing those neural networks as well, apart from the ones that I took from the individual papers. Okay, so guys, I will leave it uh, there for tonight. So thanks for your attention.